All right. Uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about the second condition of uniqueness. So uh, the second condition under which uh, we know allergen equilibrium is unique. That is a gross substitute. Okay. So uh, I guess if you studied intermediate microeconomics, you may have heard about gross substitutes. So specifically, we say two goods or gross substitutes if price of a good one increases, then machinery and demand for good two also increases. And likewise, if the price of a good two increases, then machinery and demand for a good one increases. Okay. So whenever the machinery and demand function has the same movement, uh, it moves the same direction as the price of the other good, meaning that the two goods are substitutable and we say two goods are gross substitutes. So whenever machinery and demand function is differentiable, so it has a, a well-defined derivative, gross substitute condition can be expressed as the positive sign of the derivative with respect to uh, price of the other good, like this. All right, um, so I think this definition is quite intuitive, uh, but in intermediate microeconomics, we do not distinguish uh, gross substitutes from just the substitutes. Uh, but in graduate microeconomics, we do distinguish from gross substitutes from substitutes. Uh, so for substitutes, we use a Hicksian demand function. So if the Hicksian demand has a, a different direction, it moves in different direction, uh, from the uh, price of the other good. Uh, so the, uh, the same direction, uh, sorry, so the same direction uh, as the uh, price of the other good, then uh, we say two goods are substitutes, okay? All right, so the natural extension of this concept to excess demand function is called the gross substitute property. So in order to define this property, say we have two price factors, P and P prime. And under price factor P prime, we increase the price of a good L and the price of the other goods are, you know, remain the same, okay? So are the same as before. Then if we have a higher excess demand for a good K under price factor P prime, then we say, excess demand function Z has the gross substitute property. So excess demand function is nothing but difference between machinery and demand. So Z sub K is XK minus omega K, some constant, right? So whenever machinery and demand function is differentiable, uh, excess demand function is also differentiable. So whenever this guy is differentiable. Uh, the gross substituted property can be written as, so in terms of the derivative, like this. So derivative is positive, okay? So derivative of Z sub K with respect to P sub L positive, meaning that excess demand for good K uh, moves in the same direction as the price of a good L. So the intuition is two good circle substitutes if increase in PL brings about increase in the excess demand for good K. All right? So that is a, so it can be regarded as the natural extension of uh, the standard concept of gross substitute into excess demand function. All right? So we are going to show that under our uh, gross substitute property, our uh, Wallagian equilibrium is unique. Okay. And before we prove this, uh, if we think about under which environment we have a gross substitute property. Uh, one example is right here. So whenever utility function is additively separable, so U of X can be written as summation of uh, several pieces of utility functions. So in case of two goods, uh, then U of X1 and X2 can be written as 
u sub 1 of x1 plus u sub 2 of x2. Okay. So the utility generated by some bundle uh, is totally separable. So we can separate utility from consumption of a good one and utility from consumption of a good two. Then we say utility function is additively separable. So whenever utility function has this property, we can show that uh, if this quantity, okay, so the double prime means the second order derivative, and this is the first order derivative, uh, and this quantity is lower than one for every good k, then the resulting excess demand function has the gross substitute property. So the way to show this is, I'm not going to prove this uh, uh, in detail, but let me just illustrate the, uh, let me just illustrate uh, how to prove this, uh, the, you know, how to approach this, uh, this result. So let me stick to a, a two condition, a uh, two good case. So u one x one and u two x two. We want to maximize this utility uh, given some body constraint. in order to find machinery and demand function. So the first other condition for utility maximization are uh, using Lagrangian multiplier. So let me assign one multiplier lambda to this fuzzy constraint. Then first other condition can be written as u1 prime of x1 minus lambda p1 is equal to zero. And u2 prime of x2 minus lambda p2 also equal to zero, okay? And additionally, because uh, in order to satisfy this condition, lambda must be positive. If lambda is zero, then this guy will be zero. So there is a no way to satisfy this first of the condition. So we know lambda is positive, okay? And by the Complementary slam is condition, fuzzy constraint must be binding. Okay, so we have an additional uh, condition for utility maximization problem. So that simply says, you know, uh, I think you're quite familiar with this condition now. Uh, so every resource must be exhausted for utility maximization, all right? Then, uh, we want to show that under which condition we have this x1 with respect to p2 is positive. Okay, so the way to obtain this inequality from these three conditions are uh, let me take the first other so the first first other condition uh, and take the derivative with respect to p1. Okay, then I'm gonna get u1 double prime of x1 because the x1 is now uh, the x1 is a machinery and demand so it is a function of p1 so we have to about the chain rule find the derivative like this okay and the lambda that is the shadow price of the income so at the at the optimum it is also a function of p1 if p1 changes the shadow price of the income also changes so we have this and minus lambda is equal to zero okay and similarly if we take the derivative with respect to uh, p2 so this is a uh, with respect to p1 and this is with respect to p2, we obtain x1, now derivative with respect to p2, and this one, okay. And finally, uh, let me take the derivative of the body constraint with respect to p2. Okay, fuzzy constraint. 
let me call this B, occasion B, right? Then I obtain All right, so uh, say P1 times, yeah, derivative with respect to P2 and X2 plus oh, uh, just a second, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have this. So if we combine these three conditions, then we can show that oh uh, yeah, I'm not yeah, I'm not going to so I'm not going to go into that because uh, this is a tedious, I mean this is a very tedious algebra, but if we combine these three conditions, then we can show that uh, if this is true. Then the Marshallian demand function has the GS property. So the excess demand function also uh, you know, the same property. Okay, and let me just illustrate the intuition behind this. I guess you guys have seen this condition before. Uh, when we study uh, so decision theory, so when we study decision making procedure under uncertainty, okay, this is nothing but you know, the uh, relative, so what is that? Coefficient of relative risk aversion, so C R R A uh, coefficient of relative risk aversion, C R A. Uh, I forgot the uh, exact acronym, but yeah. So if this is larger than larger, you know, the uh, so this measures the concavity, the degree of concavity of a utility function, right? So if that is a, a lower than one, then the uh, corresponding indifference curve ha is 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 more you know closer to uh, is closer to linearity. So the indifference curve is more clo is is closer to a uh, linear one. Because if that is bounded above by one, so the degree of concavity is kind of limited. That means the uh, indifference curve between two goods is more like a uh, uh, linear function. So if that is a larger and larger, then indifference curve becomes more, you know, uh, more uh, convex with respect to with respect to the origin. Okay, so we know. Uh, in case of perfect complements, uh, the indifference curve has a L shape, right? Just like a uh, Leontief preferences, right? But if the indifference curve is a more and more flat, so in case of you know linear preferences, two goods are perfectly substitutable. Okay, so that means so this inequality tells us. Uh, if the utility function is not much concave, so the degree of a concavity is a limited, uh, we obtain the GS property. Okay. So one consequence of this result is if we consider linear preference of or so x1 plus x2, so alpha times x1 plus 1 minus alpha times x2. So if the utility function is given by this linear preference or quasi-linear preference. So say square root of x1 plus x2 or uh, cup Douglas utility. So alpha times log of x1 plus uh, 1 minus alpha times log of x2. Okay. These three types satisfy uh, this inequality. In fact, cup Douglas preference, in case of cup Douglas, uh, the first derivative is uh, alpha over x1, and the second, alpha over uh, x1 squared. Okay. 
So if we take the ratio and then multiply it by x1, we have a uh, uh, exactly equal to 1. So this quantity it will be exactly equal to 1 uh, in case of cup doublers preference. Okay. So the cup doublers preference is kind of, you know, can be interpreted as the borderline uh, for this condition. But nevertheless, uh, you know, in case of cup doublers, the excess demand function satisfies the GS property because uh, if we explicitly compute the uh, Marshallian demand function in case of cup doublers, we know that in case of cup doublers, demand for a good K is going to be, uh, so among the uh, total income, uh, so in case of in case of a pure exchange economy, the income is going to be dot product between price factor and initial endowment, right? The market value of the in, uh, initial endowment. And the alpha times K, so just a portion of this income, as much as the weight on good K, will be spent for good K, right? So the demand for good K is just a, uh, uh, this portion divided by price of good K. Right, and then we subtract omega k, the initial endowment of good k, we obtain excess demand for good k. Right, and then if we ponder this expression, uh, and then take the derivative with respect to uh, pl, right, because there is a, a no pl on the bottom, uh, demand function for cup Douglas is totally separable in the sense that. We just divide income, some portion of income divided, uh, some portion of income by uh, price of the good. So the derivative of the Marshallian demand is going to be positive, right? So Cobb Douglas exhibits a uh, gross substitute property. So as a result, excess demand has a gross substitute property as well, All right? So now I'm going to show that under GS property, uh, you know, the Wallachian equilibrium is unique. Okay. And the way to prove this is the same as before. So we are going to adopt a proof by contradiction. So we first negate the, uh, the conclusion and derive a one contradiction. Okay. So suppose that we have multiple Wallachian equilibria. So price vector P star and P uh, make the, uh, so at these two price vectors, uh, excess demand function is equal to zero, okay? And P star is different from P, okay? So in case of three goods, let me say uh, this P1 star, P2 star, P3 star is different from P1, P2, P3, okay? So say this is one, two, three, and this is a four, three, and one, okay? Because these two vectors are different, okay? Then we can find alpha such that, you know, the ratio of this, or uh, the ratio of each price between these two vectors is the largest, okay? So in these examples, uh, P1 over P1 star. So its ratio is a 4. And P2 over P2 star. That is a 1.5. And then for good 3, that is a 1 third. Okay. So alpha is going to be 4. All right. And then we consider our P prime. That is defined as a, uh, so that is linearly proportional to P star. So we just multiply that number uh, to P star to obtain P prime. Okay, so we, uh, we multiply the largest ratio between these two price factors to P star to obtain P prime. Okay, so in that example, P prime becomes 4, 8, 12, all right? 
So if we multiply alpha, then you can see that price of a good one under P is the same under P prime. Okay, so we have the same price. And furthermore, P prime is a alpha proportional to P star. So because a, a Z is a homogeneous of degree zero, we obtain Z of P prime is equal to zero. So P prime is also, if this is a Wallachian equilibrium, is alpha proportion P prime is also Wallachian equilibrium. Okay? And, uh, but this P prime has the same component, the same price of some good uh, with a, a P. Okay? So now we work with this P prime and P to drive a, a some contradiction. So if we compare these two, all right, and then let me reduce this uh, price of a good two, okay, to three, four, three, twelve. Okay. So from this and this, because a uh, excess demand function has the GS property. The demand for good K will increase. So if we change the price factor from P prime to this one, we can see that Z1 uh, will decrease, right? Because uh, uh, if the excess demand function has a GS property, uh, demand for excess demand for good one has the same movement as the price of good two. The movement of a price of good two. So if P2 decreases, then Z1 also decreases. Okay? So now we decrease a uh, price of good three, say to one, okay? Then Z1 will further decrease. Okay? So what happens? At P prime, Z of P prime should be equal to zero vector because that is the equilibrium price as well. So Z1 at P prime is equal to zero. So if we first lower, if we first lower the price of a good two, we know Z1 decreases. And then subsequently, if we lower the price of good three, Z1 will further decrease. So it will take a negative value negative value, right? So that means at uh, ZK of P, oh, sorry, this is a typo, ZK of P, because uh, if we subsequently lower the price of good two and good three, uh, we can reach the uh, price of a good, uh, price, price factor P, so that means Z1 of P uh, is going to be negative, that is a contradiction, okay? So we started with Z of P as an equilibrium price. Z of P is a zero vector, right? And then we generate uh, additional price vector that is alpha proportional to P star. Okay? And then we subsequently lower the price of good two and good three. And then we obtain by the GS property uh, negative value of excess demand for good one, that is a contradiction. Right, so the Wallachian equilibrium must be unique uh, under the GS property. Right? So let me just tell you the basic intuition behind this. Why GS property leads us to a uh, unique equilibrium? So by Wallace law, we know that for every price factor P, the dot product between P and excess demand function uh, should be equal to zero. Okay. Now we take this identity, differentiate with respect to PL, then uh, this is a, a summation of summation of P sub K times Z sub K. Okay. So the derivative, partial derivative with respect to PL gives us uh, so one derivative of you know uh, PL times ZL with respect to PL. And uh, uh, 
the other pile, so the other chunk of derivatives, so p sub k times uh, the derivative of z sub k with respect to p sub l. Okay, and that should be equal to zero because the right side is equal to zero. Okay, and by the uh, GS property, we know that this one is positive, and the price is also a uh, price. You know, is clearly positive. So we have a uh, some chunk of positive numbers here. So in order to make it zero, uh, you know, the, this derivative must have a negative sign. Okay, must have a negative sign. That means if we graph uh, PL, ZL, uh, you know, on this plane, so if we put PL on the horizontal axis, if we draw a uh, PL, ZL, it's going to be monotone decreasing, okay? So we couldn't have this kind of region. So where function starts decreasing, that, you know, back up increasing and then decreasing again. Uh, we don't have, you know, we couldn't have this kind of shape. So if the function has this kind of shape, we may have a, a, a multiple equilibria. So like this one. Yeah then this P1 prime, P1 star, and P1 double prime, or equilibrium.